Hello friends, welcome to a new series that I'm doing on serotonin. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to my thoughts behind the series so that you can get an idea of where it's coming from and the purpose of the series. And I'm going to introduce you to the importance of serotonin as well as some basic uh, information about what serotonin is and its biology in the body. So first of all, let me tell you about the background for this series. Originally, uh, I planned to do a series on the different, not on all, but on several of the important or interesting um, new signaling molecules in the brain, which are called neurotransmitters. I started with acetylcholine because acetylcholine is probably the neurotransmitter that is most effectively manipulated for the purposes of enhancing cognition in terms of learning and memory in people. But what I found that, and I don't know if this was because my channel was smaller at the time, but I found that those videos got a very low uh, engagement and uh, low views and low retention, which makes me think that they were too detail-oriented for what people on YouTube generally want. So what I decided after making that series, which by the way, the reason why I make YouTube videos in the first place is because I used to write a lot, but I found that... Uh, I don't know, I'm, you know, I haven't lived for very long, but I found that these days people don't seem to want to read much. So I thought videos would be easier, but it seems that this level of detail is not very, uh, you know, accessible on videos. So what I decided to do was to compile my notes, because I have a personal journey in terms of cognitive enhancement, and I'm always researching a little bit and experimenting a little bit myself. And so I'm planning to... So what I did was I decided to compile my notes and in about five years or so to publish my own book on the subject, uh, like a, an actual book. Um, sort of, you, you could think of it like a cross between Alexander Shulgin's uh, Pickal and Tikal and uh, a non-fiction um, popular science review of the, the forefront of um, neuroscience, as well as... a yeah, so basically like a cross between the two and a little bit of a personal journey. So I'm planning to write that book, but now, in the meantime, people have started to ask me a lot about serotonin, specifically because I mention often my use of SSRIs and why I'm so fond of them. We'll get into what SSRIs are in a different video, or maybe briefly here. But the point is, people have been asking me a lot about it. And I thought I could answer the question directly, but it may leave more questions open than it actually answers. Because there's a lot of um, sort of misinformation about SSRIs, which usually the people who have misinformation about it, they call it antidepressants. Uh, and so, in fact, I, I've seen on Reddit, there's a thread in which someone was... Uh, it's a, a niche subform, but someone was trying to shame me for taking SSRIs, which I find, you know, totally absurd because I'm not even depressed. I don't think of it as an antidepressant. The reason I take an SSRI is because of the really profound impacts it can have on the brain, which is what we're going to get into here. But to understand that, you, well, I can't just do a video on SSRIs. So I'm going to do what I call like a serotonin light series. So I'm not going to go into as much detail as I did with acetylcholine. I also won't publish articles on my blog about this. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do short videos in this series about elements of serotonin and biology. So they may be very short sometimes. Sometimes they won't be monetizable. I don't, I don't care. But the point is they'll be short, easy to understand, and hopefully informative. What I will skip is not just the extreme level of detail, but I'm going to skip generally characterizing the serotonin receptors as well as their genes, their associated genes and the genome-wide association studies in relation to those genes. I actually, a large part of my notes is composed of exactly that, but I realized when trying to record this video originally, which was a little while ago, that the receptor part will be what will turn people off the subject. So I'd rather avoid that. I will mention them briefly, just to briefly characterize the differences that we know about them, but I won't go into too much detail so it doesn't bog down the listener. So I hope you guys are ready to start this journey with me. Now to begin, what is serotonin? We're going to discuss this in this video. So first of all, the name serotonin originates, let's talk about it this way. The first time the molecule was really identified was in the mid-1930s by an Italian researcher. 
But a second group of researchers, right, in fact, maybe a third group of researchers, discovered it in the blood uh, about 10 years later or so and, and named it. They named it serotonin. So what is serotonin named after? It's named after the serum, which is blood, and tone, because they noticed that serotonin seemed to cause small, uh, smooth muscles to contract in the body. So it was called serum toner serotonin. Serotonin. That's how you can think about it. Now serotonin is, so it's very available in the body, not just in the nervous system. You remember, things can be in your blood, but may not be able to cross what's called the blood brain or the blood spine barrier. And some things do cross the barrier very well. So for example, uh, steroid hormones like testosterone or estrogen cross the barrier very well. But some things don't. And that's why uh, researchers will often not only test serum levels of something like serotonin, but they will sometimes check uh, spinal uh, fluid, which is called cerebrospinal fluid. What they do is they do what's called a lumbar puncture. And they literally just, uh, usually, usually patients don't accept to do this because you, you shouldn't, by the way, if anyone ever offers this to you, don't do it, it's very painful. But they take a little bit about the, of the fluid out and check out what the, you know, the microbiology of that fluid is. So, because then you get a better sense Generally, it's thought to be that the cerebral sp spinal fluid's characterization is similar to what the brain is. But anyway, the point is, serotonin is very available in the body, but it's also available in the brain. In both cases, it's synthesized a bit differently. 95% of the serotonin in the body is synthesized by the gut, by cells called the EC cells in the gut. But separately, it's also synthesized in the brain. In both cases, it's synthesized from the precursor a protein called L-tryptophan. L-tryptophan is found in a low quantity in most protein sources. Uh, it's found in a relatively high quantity in milk, for example. But in general, other proteins will be found in much higher quantity than L-tryptophan, which is why uh, sometimes, for example, it's thought, and therefore, just to give an example, there's a theory that when you eat a heavy carb meal, the reason why you get sleepy afterwards is because insulin shuttles a lot of the nutrients in your blood, out of your blood, allowing L-tryptophan to be carried by the transporter that takes it across the blood-brain barrier. That same transporter competes with, I mean, L-tryptophan competes with other proteins for that same transporter. So when L-tryptophan has a higher concentration in the blood, it's more likely to be carried into the brain, and melatonin is produced downstream from, from uh, L-tryptophan, but we'll get into that in a bit. So that could be why people get too sleepy after that. Anyway, the point is, in the body, it's converted, it's uh, synthesized in the gut. In the brain, it's converted, or it's synthesized, sorry, in an area of the brain called the RAPH nuclei, that is R-A-P-H-E nuclei. These are found along the brain stem. There are two kinds of RAF nuclei. One are uh, called the rostral group and one are called the caudal group. The rostral group have what are called axons, which you can imagine as sort of tentacles that veer out of the area. These axons go to the forebrain, forward. The caudal group have axons that go backwards. These axons are what send neurotransmitters across the brain. So serotonin is sent forward by the uh, rostral group and backwards by the caudal group of what are called serotonergic neurons in the RAF nuclei. Serotonergic, by the way, means a neuron that produces serotonin, not a neuron that necessarily just receives signals from, neuron, from uh, serotonin. And what is a neurotransmitter? A neurotransmitter is something that communicates between neurons. So a neuron in the, they're described usually according to the synaptic cleft. That means two neurons are facing each other, one has serotonin, it transmits the serotonin through the synaptic cleft to the other neuron. There's a receptor, serotonin receptor here of some kind, of which there are a few, we'll talk about later. It receives the signal, and after it receives the signal, there's an, uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but there's a transporter called serotonin transporter. This transporter, CERT, takes, it, takes the, sig the serotonin back into the presynaptic neuron. If CERT doesn't do that, what happens is a degradation en enzyme called monoamine oxidase degrades serotonin. Also, serotonin, other things can happen to it too. So, for example, serotonin can be uh, methylated into melatonin. Melatonin is a downstream neurotransmitter. 
that is very much involved in our sleep-wake cycle. In fact, melatonin is one of the three main hormones involved in the sleep-wake cycle. And I'm sure you guys have heard about melatonin because of supplemental melatonin. Now, regarding the synthesis of serotonin, I want you guys to know, in the body, serotonin is synthesized by tryptophan hydroxylase 1, which is an enzyme. Uh, basically, our tryptophan becomes uh, 5-HTP, which is 5-hydroxy tryptophan, and then it turns into uh, 5-HT, which is serotonin. But in the brain, it is not uh, converted by the same enzyme exactly. It's not TPH1, which is tryptophan hydroxylase 1, but instead it's tryptophan hydroxylase 2. So tryptophan hydroxylase 2 is the, one, is the enzyme, the rate-limiting step that's involved in the conversion of tryptophan into serotonin because it's what converts tryptophan into 5-HTP. The conversion of 5-HTP to 5-HT is not a rate-limiting step. Which is why it's more effective if you want to nutritionally increase your, at least the precursor availability to serotonin synthesis, to skip the tryptophan hydroxylase 2 step, because that's the rate limiting step. So if you go to directly to 5-HTP, it'll convert to 5-HT very quickly. But if you take nutritional tryptophan, it'll convert less quickly because you're limited by the rate limiting step of the availability of tryptophan hydroxylase 2. So this is a little annoying actually because most of the studies on the subject study a dietary tryptophan. They don't study 5-HTP supplementation. That's just because these studies have been going on for a very long time and I think probably the availability of 5-HTP was not there before. So here's a couple of things. I talked about the synthesis in the brain and the degradation. So when, when serotonin goes between the synaptic cleft, the serotonin transporter has to move serotonin back to the presynaptic uh, uh, neuron or it can be degraded in the brain. And this is, by the way, where the function of the SSRI comes in. You also have the synthesis of serotonin and the downstream uh, synthesis of other hormones like melatonin. Now, one thing I'd like to mention is that for a very long time, researchers thought that serotonin was only moved from the postsynaptic neuron to the presynaptic neuron with the transporter CERT. Now, for a long time, CERT was thought to be the only transporter involved in the transport of serotonin from the postsynaptic neuron to the presynaptic neuron. Uh, you know, there are other neurotransmitters like GABA and glycine that have multiple transporters. But it was later discovered that actually it's not just CERT. There is another class of transporters. Um, there are actually two of them. One is VMAT and there's another one called OCT also that transports serotonin with a lower affinity than CERT from the postsynaptic neuron to the presynaptic neuron. But they only transport, these, this class of transporters transport about 40% of serotonin's transport. The rest, the 60% is from CERT. Now, just for you guys to know, first of all, I want you to know that these other transporters, as I said, have lower affinity for serotonin, which means that CERT competitively will be more active, but they do have higher volume capacity, meaning they can carry more serotonin. Now, just we haven't gone into SSRIs yet, but I just want you guys to know, SSRIs work on CERT, but not on the other class of transporters. So you can imagine that if you have a brain that uses more of those transporters than other people, which could be due to genetic polymorphisms, you may have less of an effect from an SSRI, for example. But also, some SSRIs do inhibit VMAT and the other transporter a little bit. Uh, the ones that do that most are actually fluvoxamine and certaline just for your notes in case you're wondering. But generally, they don't inhibit them very much. So that's my introduction to serotonin. The final thing I wanted to say is regarding how important serotonin is. I just want to give an example. In 1991, there was a study with ververt monkeys. When, when scientists study monkeys, the reason they're doing this is they're trying to get closer to the human effects. So, and it's much more difficult to study monkeys than mice or, or rats because they live longer. So that's the, the main problem. And they're less well understood. Uh, but they, they are closer examples to humans. So, especially when you're dealing with social characteristics, it's important to consider them. Uh, so, there were 12 groups of vervet monkeys, each with a dominant male in them, and two subordinate males. What the researchers did was remove the dominant male from each of the groups, and then at random, select one of the subordinate males to take a serotonin-enhancing regimen of either an SSRI or a tryptophan-rich diet. Or, the other, and, and when they did this, the other male, subordinate male, which was selected by random again, uh, randomly, sorry, 
was given a drug that reduces serotonergic activity in the brain. There were two options of the drugs. In all 12 cases, the monkey, given the serotonergic treatment, became the next dominant male in the hierarchy. Now, why is this, you know, what does this mean? What it means is not completely clear. Serotonin is not something that makes one aggressive or domineering in general. Serotonergic activity, let's say, does not do that. But it does have a very, very important element to the feeling of well-being in, in humans and in uh, vertebrates. You know, it depends on the kind of animal, actually. In vertebrates and vertebrates react to serotonin a little bit differently. But let's say in terms of mammals, mammals respond clearly to serotonin in a way that makes them feel somewhat um, at peace inside, grounded, stuff like that. I'll get into much more detail about this. This sounds a little unscientific, or ascientific, sorry. But I'll get into more detail about this in, in the future clips, which I'm going to record all in one go. But I just want you guys to think about that. So if you are someone with a lower serotonergic activity in your body, like, uh, for example, many people are. I mean, I was like that throughout most of my life. It has some advantages, but it makes you, and this is something actually I probably won't discuss in these videos, but essentially it makes you less resilient. And resilience, by the way, is a subject that's studied extensively in scientific literature as of late, in the last 10 years. There are a lot of papers coming out, out about human resilience and what it takes to be resilient in terms of uh, genetics and in terms of uh, neuroscience. But re I really strongly believe that serotonin plays a strong role in resilience. So I wanted you guys to take that example to inspire you to see how important serotonin, serotonergic activity can be in the body. I'm going to try to keep these videos as free of uh, you know, technical detail as possible and as easy to understand as possible. And uh, I will see you in the next clip which I don't know how these will come out. Maybe they'll come out every day. Maybe they'll come out every few days. But keep that in mind. This is a serotonergic series. I hope when you leave it, you'll know more about serotonin than most psychiatrists. All right. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.